All right, I'm out of time. Brother Cooper. The stand. There's blood circulating. This 
landmark is set here because you need to know this. You need to remember this. Landmark also used as a base point. This is where I started from. This is the landmark where I started from. This is where I go back to. Yeah. Is God concerned about landmarks? Is God concerned about history? Look at Joshua chapter 4. Joshua chapter 4. Yeah. In fact, if you get to think about it, all of the Old Testament is history. All of it, including Psalms, is history. If you really get to think about it, so is all the New Testament. Except for one book. And a portion of that is history. Look at Proverbs chapter, or Proverbs, Joshua chapter 4. <coughs> Brother Tears, would you read verses 1 through 7 for us? It came to pass when all the people were clean, passed over Jordan, that they, the Lord spake unto Joshua, saying, Take thou twelve men out of the people of every tribe of man, and command ye them, saying, Take ye hence out of the midst of the Jordan, out of the place where the priest's feet stood firm in twelve stones. And ye shall carry them over with you, and leave them in the lodging, in the lodging place where ye shall lodge this night. Then Joshua called the twelve men whom he had prepared of the children of Israel out of every tribe and man. And Joshua said unto them, Pass over before the ark of the Lord your God <clears throat> into the midst of Jordan, and take ye up every man of you a stone upon his shoulder, according to the number of the tribes of the children of Israel that this may be a sign among you, that when your children ask their fathers in time to come, saying, What mean ye by these stones? Then ye shall answer them, that the waters of Jordan were cut off before the ark of the covenant before of the Lord. When it passed over Jordan, the waters of Jordan were cut off, and these stones shall be for memorial unto the children of Israel forever. So what did God want to do there? He got him safely over the river Jordan. What did God want to do there? Put a memorial. <clears throat> he told him to build a memorial. Why did he tell him to do that? So they could do what? All the kids. He told the kids. Because you know, the amazing thing is, you've already lived history. The moment that that happened, and they crossed over, it was history. Now you need to remember it, lest you forget it. There are some lessons that you need to learn from that. You need to remember it. And you need to teach it to your children so that they remember it. Now, frankly, we're not real good about that. We have children leave high school and church at the same time. Because we're not real good about teaching the children the landmarks, the memorials, the history, the value. Along with that verse in uh, chapter 22, 28, um, I'd like to go to chapter 23, verse 10. Talks about removing that landmark and entering into the fields of the fathers. It talks about, you know, if you're able to have that landmark in the salt. You go to uh, Judges chapter 2, see, that was one of the great failures of that generation. For failing to teach the kids. Entering into the fields of the fathers, no teaching. You know, fatherless kids today, delinquents. You know, kids that have got no future, end up either dead or in prison and they're absolutely, you know, you know crazy people. We have to deal with by the time they're, uh, they get to a high school age, they don't have to, they don't have a father. Good point. Good point. Look at verses 21 through 24 now. And he spake unto the children of Israel, saying, When your children shall ask their fathers in time to come, saying, What mean these stones? Then you shall let your children know, saying, Israel came over this Jordan on dry land. The Lord your God dried up the waters of Jordan from before you until you were cast over. 
as the Lord your God did to the Red Sea, which he dried up from before us until we were gone over. Verse 24. What was the whole thing? And what is the whole point of history? The Baptist history is special. So when children ask why we do this, we're just supposed to tell them, shut up and do what I tell you. <laughs> <laughs> Basically, that's that's Unfortunate, that's the that's the pragmatic answer. You're going to church because I told you you're going to church. Now get in the car and shut up. Which engenders animosity and hatred and rebellion. I'm real good about doing something if I've explained to me why I am doing it. To this day, you explain to me why I've got to do this, I'm good with it. Just to tell me I've got to do it, I'll sit down. You were raised different than that, brother. <laughs> I was, uh, but I still am rebellious about yeah. that. That's different than what we have here. What we have today is we have people asking why. Why do we... Okay, that might as well have some fun with it early on. Why do we sing first? Why do we then have a devotional? Why are we then dismissed to Sunday school? Why do we have music? Why is the preaching last? Why is the last thing we do an invitational? Why do we have youth rallies? Those are not bad questions if you're actually your intent is to learn the history of why we do those things. But if you're asking why to rebel against the system so you can change it, then your motives are off course, and that's where we get into problems. Yeah. But we all ought to know why we do the things that we do. Yeah. This is a great class for that. You ought to be firm and settled that God has a purpose and we are orderly people and we do things in order because of what God has said. <clears throat> yeah. um, did you know John Adams? He was president of the United States for a while. I never knew that. Some of room like. Um, <laughs> He had a biographer come to talk to him in his elder years after he left the White House. And he wasn't a Baptist, but he was a very devout man. And uh, the biographer was surprised and appalled that come Sunday the man went to church on Sunday and then went back to church Sunday evening. Wow. That was 200 years ago. And 200 years later, we have churches going, you know, that's just too much. That's just too much. We've got to just, you know, make it one, just, just shorten it down, you know. Now these guys, the biographer is coming, they went through the weather to the church building twice on a Sunday. And when he asked John Adams about it, he said, because it's the Lord's day. That's what we do. The beginning of the day and the end of the day. We set it aside for God. That was the second president of the United States. So go. We're talking about the landmark thing and teaching about the, you know, as a father takes his son out to the field and he says, okay, these are our landmarks. These are why they're here and this is when they were put here and you teach them about them. Uh, and that son should come to appreciate them, but if he doesn't learn about them, then he's not going to appreciate them. And then when it's his land to take care of, and it's his flocks that are on the land or whatever, and he walks out there and they're knocked down, or they've been moved, or whatever, he's not going to he's not going to work to rebuild those. He's not going to work to put them back because they're not important to him. They're just they never were taught to them. They never were made important to them. And it's a lot of work to pick up all those rocks and put them back up. So you just you let them go. You let them break down. <coughs> a couple of years later, a couple of generations later, there's no inheritance. There's nothing left. Nothing left. Look at verse number 24. What's so important about those stones? What is so important about Baptist history? that all the people of the earth might know the hand of the Lord, that it is mighty, that you might fear the Lord your God forever. That's why those stones were moved. It just wasn't... We had an event several years ago we wanted to remember. <coughs> it was because of the, 
that all the earth, everybody on the earth might know the hand of the Lord, that it is mighty. Do you realize the fact that we are in a New Testament church in 2013 is testimony that the hand of the Lord is mighty? Amen. We say that, we don't understand what we're saying, brethren. 99.9% .9 of Christianity does not believe that the Lord had the power to sustain an organization He Himself created. That it died out. That it had to be reorganized. That good men got moved by God at some point to just follow Him on their own whim. But we believe what this says. That the hand of the Lord is mighty. That we might fear the Lord forever. <coughs> because it's still here. Still here. Has always been here. And nothing, no amount of hate, no amount of pressure, no amount of wealth, no amount of power has been able to extinguish it. They may have been able to kill it in one place. The Lord seemed fit to keep it secreted and survive it in others. Brother Jacob, <coughs> how can Brother I found it kind of funny, um, a couple weeks ago I went to lunch with my cousin, um, one of them on my mom's side, and he asked, he was asking some questions about our church and what we believe and stuff like that, and he asked um, when we got our start, and without, just with my normal answer, I didn't even think about the Sea Shore of Galilee, the first church they started on the Sea Shore of Galilee. And then just a look of bewilderment. Mm -hmm. It's like, what? Mm -hmm. <laughs> I mean, I hadn't really thought, oh yeah, other people don't believe that. They, they can go and see that this man started it and all that stuff. But I guess that was the first time I've seen the look of bewilderment on somebody's face when <coughs> I tell them, yeah, it goes all the way back to Jesus. You might have fun get a hold of a Mormon, because Mormons have their doctrine down real cold. and They, they love to get in debate about where the church started, because... You get in a debate with a Mormon, and they're used to Christians saying, well, it kind of goes to the cat, and it got kind of died out, and kind of went. You tell them, see short Galilee, they go, well, what? Mm -hmm. Joseph Smith had no authority. God did not need to be organized and start again. It's always been here. Well, well, what? You guys are too late to the party. Mm -hmm. What, what? Because they can debate with the Catholics about going off and have to be reorganized. That's just a different version of a Protestant. Mm -hmm. But get a hold of somebody that says, see George Ali. That's got some power. That's got some depth. That's got some authority. That's, that's important. That's Baptist history. That's true Baptist history. Not a phony baloney garbage. Not a phony baloney. Southern Baptists mm -hmm. are in name only. By the way, they say 1845 is when the Southern Baptists started. Southern Baptist Convention came out of the General Convention. Mm -hmm. If you came out of a convention, you're wrong. Period. Right. Period. The general you know why the Southern Baptist came out? You might have heard about it. It was 1845. Guess what happens 15 years later? Civil War. Civil War. They came out because they were supporting slavery. Now there's an issue you really want to stand the Bible on, isn't it? The Bible talks about slavery? Yes, it does. In whatever condition you find yourself in, God's concerned about getting his people saved, not about political stands at any particular time. But these idiots, who wanted to call themselves Baptists, wanted to parade a banner up and say, we believe in slavery. That's the church you want to claim yourself in? I want you to roll the clock ahead. Now they claim to be Protestants. <clears throat> Well, maybe they are, because they never were a lot of part of us. They like to say landmarkers came out of Southern Baptists in the 1880s. Landmarkers never came out of the Southern Baptists. That's right. What came out of was the landmarkers dealt with Southern Baptist churches and said, you guys ought to quit, go away, come to the truth. Now, some churches that had good roots that got sucked into the convention did come back out. Some didn't. Some good churches went into the convention. Does that happen? It's happening right now. Mm -hmm. You see good churches going away all the time. Mm -hmm. But for a good 20 year period of time, the landmarkers really dealt with the convention, trying to work with those churches. 
So much so that the convention got confused enough to say they were part of us. We never was part of them. But you need to know what the truth is. Because what's the point? Right now we have an individual running around singing the Springfield Church in the town of Roseville. Why? Why make that a big deal? Because Roseville was started with one of the Lord's supper. That individual was to give his credit and, and destroy the Springfield Lord. Mm -hmm. By saying it came out of Roseville. Because of some, some publication that doesn't know the truth. You need to know the truth. So whether you're dealing with a discredited wannabe diatrophies, or you're dealing with a Mormon, or you're dealing with a Catholic, or you're dealing with anybody, you know what the truth is, and you can give them verse 24, that all the people of the earth might know the hand of the Lord, that it is mighty, and you might fear the Lord your God forever. Once you get a hold of that, mercy, to know that there is a church that goes right back to the seashore of Galilee, that God is still present and powerful and moving is important to understand important to share because most people don't see that I went to a funeral this week and a guy got up and he did the best job that he could do used the name of Jesus spoke about the Holy Spirit read some verses out of the Bible and it was lifeless and as dead as the corpse in the casket because he gave no hope nor could he nor could he give hope, because he knew not what he spoke of. Mm -hmm. We do. Mm -hmm. We have that power. We have that God. What we need to do is share it. To share it, we need to know it and understand it, Brother Hawker and Brother Anderson. Yeah, churches need to get a hold of that verse <laughs> simply because they, you know, we're getting into this realm where the church authority, you know, we have the authority to do whatever we want because we're the church. Yeah. The reason why we're a church is to show the world. Yep. And we're we're commanded to be separate and different. And we we seem to be. I don't even like saying we. I don't conform to it. Churches, our churches, are trying to conform to the way things are done in religion today. They're moving around these landmarks because of, for them, and they're missing the fact that it's for the world. We're here for the earth. The the earth would know. It would be. We can't continually try to be like everybody else and be separate at the same time. We're only here to do the work of the Lord. That's our purpose. When we get caught up in removing these landmarks to benefit the convenience of my life, that we're losing the whole point of what we're here for. Well, if you're talking about landmarks being doctrines, yeah, but if you're talking about changes of time and stuff. Those are those are landmark doctrines. You gotta go back to the tabernacle to see your times. It's morning and evening they went in there to do their sacrifices. Morning and evening. Morning and all. Well, that's a picture and a type and a shadow of who we are today. Morning and evening. Not only that, you get the Lord's day. And it was devoted to the Lord. Mm -hmm. The reason there was a morning and an evening was from sun up to sundown, you were devoted that to the Lord. And there was a morning and an evening offering. It was a gathering morning and evening. And our forefathers knew that. And they established that as part of our service. Brother Hawker mentioned a while ago, why do we do this and that and other things? We sang a song and then we did the preaching. Listen, there's a Bible order in there someplace. There's an example. We're not under the law, but that's a, that's a foolish argument. No, uh, brother. It is, because, because these wow. things happen to them for our example. You see, the yeah. Hebrews didn't state I'm that? I'm saying, if you're saying that that, is, that stops us from being a doctrinal church, no, didn't, we didn't say well, that. I don't believe. It will to weaken it to that point. You're declaring them to be landmarks. It will weaken it to that point, though. If you are to, oh, it will not. It will too. If you're declaring them to be landmarks, doctrinal absolutes, then you are saying that we have to follow according to the law. Doctrine the and the law. Of God. Practice. Yeah, the testimony of the Lord. The Doctrine and practice. Practice. Doctrine and practice. That's what we base fellowship on. Doctrine and practice. That's practice. The practice needs to be according to this. So then according to Acts 1, it says we meet daily. We're supposed to meet daily. So much the more. So much the more. But we don't meet daily, Let's, so therefore we are uh, not. Wait a minute. That's, th that's, just hold it a second. <laughs> they meant daily, but it didn't tell us to do it. It doesn't teach us anywhere to do no, that. But it does, it does, it does, that we're to meet on the first day of the week. And the example of the Old Testament is morning and evening, and there's a good reason for the morning and the evening. 
and to make one service out of it for convenience sake, and that's what they do, or a morning and an afternoon service, brother, that's I believe wholeheartedly that we should. I believe that we should eat. I, I like the ways that we do it. But to say that we must is to take Colossians chapter 2 and to say that this is not so. Colossians chapter 2, when it talks... Well, then then we don't need to must right. observe the Lord's Supper. We don't need to must exclude church no, members. Saying, that's saying, that's saying we have approach. to observe this based on doctrine, that, we, that this makes an integral not scripture. When it says, well, let no, let no man we base, we we base fellowship on whether or not church is an error. And when a Absolutely. church starts doing that, pretty soon they're going to be an error. And I never see it fail. I take you to a church in Arizona right now that started out having uh, that church, that services for convenience. And they dropped BTC. And they had an afternoon service. And then pretty soon they dropped the afternoon service. And then they dropped the midweek service. Verse 16, Colossians 2, let no man therefore judge you of meat or drink and respect the holy day. Or the new moon or the Sabbath. Now I agree with you. The Man's not Lord judging Lord. you, the Bible is, my friend. <laughs> You're right. Not, That's to, right, judge, because not it's... to do so, not to not to esteem one day or make one day as a holy day. Let no man therefore judge you. First day of the week, the Bible makes a holy day. As an example. You're right. But all days so are the Lord, Lord, one esteem. One steams one day above the other, another steams all days the same. I believe every day is the Lord's day. The context of what you're quoting there was to combat the seventh day that they were trying to oppose. And we have the first day of the week to deal with, and it's clear. And, it's an, and I think that we should do so. I think that I believe that we should do so. I think it's the right practice. I think it's a beneficial practice. I think it's a, a very healthy practice to do so, but to declare that it makes an individual or an individual church unscriptural. It's not going against going strictly. Now the only one that I've heard say that was you. Yeah. Yeah. We've said it was an error. Well it's an error. Okay. okay. That is an error. error. Okay. To say it's an error it's is an error. to say it's going against the Bible. An error. Well right. they are. There's no morning and evening offering in, in that situation. Where does it say they, the they're not following that example. Where does it say so the they're in error. Practice? Where does it say New Testament practice that we are to be morning and evening on Sunday? Now you're, now you're struggling as strong. Yeah, yeah you really are, really are, because in the book of Acts, you will find that as a practice. And the book of Acts, you also see where they met daily. So then, therefore, because we don't need daily, we're not trying to... Brother scripture. Daniel, enough. But uh, let's go on and see where it was going to go. If you're going to be argumentative, and just for argumentative sake, enough. You're no, straight, and that's what you're that's accusing us of. Brother, don't argue with me. I'm a teacher, you're a student. If you don't get that clear, you can win. This is not going to go on. We must understand that there's a difference between being unscriptural and being an error. And people that go toward error do not go toward scripturality. You don't go to the light by going further into the dark. Period. We have the Old Testament example of morning and evening worship. We have the example and practice in the New Testament of morning and evening. Now, to say now that that is okay not to do so is nothing wrong with it. We have the Old Testament example of it. We have the New Testament practice of it. To say that is, we shouldn't call it unscriptural, fine. It's not unscriptural, but it is error. And error will lead to worse things. We just had an example Brother Crabtree mentioned in Arizona. <laughs> These are the sort of things that Baptist history is replete with. Because you're going to see the major errors, and we'll be looking at them over time, the major errors that come into the church come in like this. They do not stand up with somebody saying, I am going to be baptizing a baby tomorrow. Everybody come. And I will be doing so by sprinkling on his head so he doesn't get drowned. Y'all show up now. <laughs> that doesn't come in that way. It comes in very subtly with small little steps. <coughs> small little steps where when it's finally done nobody's in disagreement because they made the other steps and this is just the next logical going back to Brother Crafty's part the next logical step in that progression 
like Brother Daniel's argument, saying, well, you're saying it's unscriptural, and you, you phrased it, if you notice, you phrased it by saying, this is unscriptural, and you're saying it's unscriptural. No, Brother Daniel was the only one who said it was unscriptural for that. But then he phrased it as an opposition, is, you're saying it's unscriptural. No, it's error to do that. You've got to listen to the argument, listen to the reasons. Brother Daniel was real good at being argumentative, but we need to understand where this goes, and where the progress goes. Baptist history is going to be replete, and you'll learn a lot. Because you're living it. You're living it. Right now, there are churches that we fellowship with. There's churches that we, or mission works that we're going to create into churches, and other works the way I'm even beginning it. That will be all part of Baptist history. Some of them will no doubt continue with us. Some of them no doubt will not. And it's the individual's choices about how they deal with issues like this. Where do they take them? How far do they take them? Do they make it a doctrine? Do they not make it a doctrine? What, what, what's going to be the standing standard by which you test fellowship? Well, that, that argument has been used with every split this work has had. The argument with the twice married preacher issue was that's never been made a test of fellowship. The argument with Newport was why in the Lord's Supper that's never been made a test of fellowship. And as we continue on, you know, it may begin with a small thing and lead to other things. And if we uh, stray from the patterns, the examples, and, you know, <clears throat> so if a church changes their time, maybe, you know, maybe that's not the biggest deal. But, but why are they changing it? That's the big deal. Why? And we look at and we see the examples in the scriptures, and when we... And, you know, and Brother Crabtree brought it on his class. Obviously, we don't practice what we practice just because our forefathers did, but our forefathers were not ignorant. They had the same Holy Spirit as comfort that we have as comfort. And the more that I look and I see examples, not only in the scriptures, but also in our history, true history, because there's a lot of false history out there. But as you read and see, I know I shouldn't be amazed, but it does. It thrills my heart. When I read and study from some of our forefathers, they sneak and believe just like I believe. Mm -hmm. and, it, and I don't know why it still amazes me, but it does. And it excites me that, you know, they have the whole, same Holy Spirit. Brother Gonzalez, every time he comes out here, it thrills my heart. Yes, I love him, and I enjoy visiting with him. But what excites me is that he wasn't raised out here. Mm -hmm. He wasn't taught by any of our brethren out here or any of our churches, but he believes and practices just exactly like we do. Why? Because the Holy Spirit is comforted. Teaches him just like the Holy Spirit is comforted. Teaches him. Exactly. Brother Anderson, I've always been amazed at uh, how the world says that we can't trace our lineage back to Christ. But every other religion out there that started prior to the medieval ages could trace theirs over back. How is that? The Catholics started before the Middle Ages. Mm -hmm. They shouldn't have been, they should have had to start over again and have another starting point. Uh, the Muslims, go well, back to Muhammad 1800 years ago, they should have had to start over again. So if they can, why do they have an argument that we can't? <laughs> yeah. Brother well, with the church first time, Brother Bob and I just got done preaching at a church in California that for the sake of their having preachers travel, they changed their service time. And I don't know if they had BTC before, but they don't have BTC now. And I'm scared for that church and worried for that church because exactly the order that Brother Crabby said when churches make decisions to limit the time that they're coming to the Lord's house for carnal reasons it destroys churches, and I, I can see very clearly how, just from being there one service, how that church in a couple months might not be there, because for one, the teaching that goes on, or the lack of, I should say. Mm -hmm. um, but to say, to separate what is an error and what's against, or unscriptural, anything that's unscriptural is an error, and anything that's an error is unscriptural. <coughs> that is why it's an error, because it's not found in the scriptures. And there's a danger in taking things that I, if I was pastoring in the church on Sunday, somebody brought up 
to, or even in Albany, if somebody brought up to change our church service, I would fight as hard as I can not to because of the pattern that I've seen. But to call that, make that a test of fellowship, or to make that something that puts a church in error means that the church in Springfield in our work is getting close to starting a church in the Grand in error. And that, that, because that's, that's where it can get. And that, I've talked to Brother Daniel multiple times. Him and I have had the same argument that we just got them having. And from talking to Brother Daniel, I know that the reason why he gets, he's not just trying to be argumentative, is because there is a danger, and I've, Brother Crouch, he's told me about the danger of the church in Ben. Before they got into all the, their error, they started making things landmarks and standing for things that were not found in the scriptures. <coughs> and at the time, correct me if I'm wrong, but if I remember right, it was two years ago, and he, I wrote it down in my notebook. He said, from the time, it didn't really look that bad. Hindsight being 2020, looking back, you can see where the error started. It wasn't with ordaining a twice married man. It was back when they started teaching things making them tests of fellowship, making them uh, the same as doctrines, teachings, doctrines of men as a teaching, doctrines of God. And that is where they went into error. And that led, ten years down the road, to the error where now it is a test of fellowship. And now it is something that they split off. And so that's the danger in even just saying an error versus unscriptural is that you make something a landmark, make something a test of fellowship, destroy destroy either fellowship between churches or, or blemish the espoused pride of Christ based on things that God hasn't done that with. Now, using anybody can use that argument with anything in the Bible. You can say that, well, baptism for salvation is something that we shouldn't take as... But that's not true. They can say whatever they want. We need to use this. And if we can find in this, I believe full heartedly that there's a pattern, and I believe that we need to stick to the pattern about church service times. I see the health in that. But to say that a church, because Sister Rana said it just right, why do they want to change? Guess what? I, I don't know why church down the road wants to change. Now, I can, I can and I should admonish, if I have the opportunity to manage that church, admonish members from that church, and say, there's a dangerous pattern that you are putting yourself in a position to follow. But I can't say for that church, if I'm not a part of that church, what their reasoning was. I can't say that because they decide once a month to meet in the afternoon, that they are now in error. I, I biblically do not have that right. Well, there's error in every church. But we don't withdraw fellowship just because of any error. Right. And, okay? Yeah. Now, this is the, the and I have admonished our missionary to, to get their times regulated properly. So far, he hasn't chosen to lead them to do that. And so I don't dictate, because I feel like that God's man is there, and let the Lord lead him, and, and if he follows, then he'll be okay, and if he doesn't, he'll follow the ditch someplace or other, we'll have him get out. Mm -hmm. The thing of it is, Brother Daniel, when he said, make them unscriptural, you're talking about making a church unscriptural, uh, and so therefore it ceases to be a church, no. if it's unscriptural. No, right okay, so to differentiate that, they're in error. Now, again, to change those services is error because it leaves the pattern we have in the Old Testament, the example for us. Now, is it something to withdraw fellowship from? Well, there's churches that believe that the church started on the mountaintop uh, and rather than the seashores of Galilee. Uh, that's error as far as I'm concerned, but we don't break fellowship over that. Changing the times of services, we don't break fellowship over that. But we do need to contend that we need to follow that example and admonish and encourage them, as you mentioned, to do so. And that, that's the whole point of it. And when you say unscriptural, maybe it's because of the battles that we fought years ago. You talk about making a church unscriptural. Listen, as far as I'm concerned, the Ben Church may not be unscriptural as far as belonging to the Lord. It may still belong to the Lord and be in error. But then again, it may not. We're not in the business of removing the candlestick. But we are in the business of recognizing people going off and to what degree it is. And there are some things that 
some error that we can we can tolerate, and some we can't. The cardinal doctrines we cannot compromise. Who says this truth? Mm -hmm. 